Hi everyone, welcome to this week's live stream. Um, we hope that you can all see and hear us okay. Um, firstly, apologies for last week's cancelled live streams. I'm going to get into it. It wasn't pleasant for me and Spencer. We spent a long time trying to solve it. We just couldn't. It wasn't fun, but we're back. Hopefully, you can see and hear us. Please let us know if everything's going okay. Um, what you've been up to this week? Brilliant to hear. I'm really excited to show you everything this week. I was good that I couldn't do it last week. Um, for those of you that have never tuned in before, this is your first time. Where have you been? Um, my name is Richard Stubbley. I'm a process specialist. Um, I'm in the Birmingham Technology Centre, um, one of the Autodesk Technology Centres, and we've got Spencer on the call as well. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, for the, good to be back. Take two, Rich. Hopefully, uh, we're coming through nice, loud, and, and clear. Uh, again, for those of you who haven't joined before, Spencer Hardcastle, uh, customer advocate on the Fusion 360 side, and uh, it's a pleasure to be back in your company on another live stream, Rich. Wow, thanks, Spence. So, yeah, no, it's um, well, it's the time of week that we have a bit of fun together as well, so it's quite nice. How is everyone? Can they see and hear us? Have we actually gone live this week? Yeah, we, well, we've got EL in the comments, ah. but uh, let's see in those comments, as it said, what have you been making? What have you been doing? Any questions for Rich? The harder, the better. We, you know we like to trip him up on the, uh, the Thursday live stream. So, any questions you have for Fusion... And, and fusion manufacturing in particular, let us hear them in the in the chat. So you spent your saying there was already a question in the chat. Yeah, we do have one uh, from El. He would like to hear some tips on how to set up some low profile clamping for very thin pieces of wood. Okay. Um, he needs to clamp them down without high. We, sorry, he needs to clamp them without hiding any of the top surface or almost none of the top surface. Okay, so there's, there's a couple of ways you could go about this. Um, the first one being, so it's wood, I imagine it's probably quite nice wood and you don't want to damage it, so metal clamps might be out of, out of bounds here. What I would potentially do is make up basically just some, some little wooden blocks and then I don't know what machine you've got, what machine you've got it on, but if I was doing this at home on my little uh, Denford Nova Mill, I have a spoil board or a sacrificial bed, basically something that you don't mind screwing stuff down to, it can get ruined, it's cheap, it's normally made out of ply or MDF, whatever you want it made out of. Um, but also I'm guessing you haven't got a vacuum table, because if you have got a vacuum table then you just put it straight down and away you go. So if you haven't got a vacuum table, what I would potentially do, there's three ways I'd do it, first one would be to make some wooden blocks push those into the side, I'd even probably use some hand clamps to really get it tight, and then screw down my wooden clamps um, down onto my spoil board to hold the part in place. Um, I'd probably have my wooden clamps that I've just made, all those wooden blocks, slightly too tall, and then just machine them off. Doesn't matter, it's only wood. Machine it off when you machine off your um, top face of your part. Let's say you've got 5 mil stock and you want to machine it down to 4 mil. Doesn't matter if your clamps are 10 mil, just machine the top of the clamps off, it's fine. So it would, it's not going to cause any problems. Idea number two would be, it depends on how you're doing it in the parts, but I machine a lot of one millimeter stainless plate on my Denford Nova mill. And what I do on there is with a hand drill, quite simply, I'll start off with a square sheet. I just drill four holes in the corners of my little pillar drill. I then screw down those four into the um, spoil board to hold it steady. I then normally have got some sort of fixing holes in my stainless part. You know, there's very rarely you do a part without any holes in it. It's very rare you do a complete profile out of a part. So I drill those holes first. I then put some more screws and washers through those holes and then I profile cut out my stainless plate. So all I'm doing is just putting screws and washers to hold that stainless plate down. I did originally use double-sided tape but it didn't work all the time and it occasionally flicked up or it held it so tight I'd have to lever it off and I'd bend my plates up so I just stopped using double-sided tape. I wasn't, didn't, didn't find it any, any use for me. Third and final way, and then I'll stop talking, I promise, um, would be to do, something, do some tabbing. So in Fusion Contour you can do tabbing, so you can secure the outsides down, you can screw those down. Again, it depends on your part if you can do this. Then do a contour profile around the outside of the part, leaving some nice little tabs Really easy, 
chop them off with a flush cut saw afterwards, a bit of a sand, you should never see where the tabs were. Hope that answers the question. If not, well, that was quite interesting, actually, a question before we started. Yeah, I think I think it does. Um, ice Cream's with us. Good to have you here, Ice Cream. Stuart from Hull, good to have you here as well. Klaus from Germany. Um, ice Cream suggested uh, uh, blue tape and super glue. Works yeah. well for him, so I guess that's an option. Um, vacuum Werber holding would be my preferred method for thin parts. That came from Klaus. Oh, thank you. See, I kind of thought a vacuum table, so I just made it with screws and washers. <laughs> and I know someone over me was tiny, it wouldn't really warrant a vacuum table. I could probably suck through a straw the amount that I'd need to hold it down. But anyway, right, let's crack on with today's live stream, everyone. Hope all is going well. Um, do you remember this part? I It's been my... I've lived this part for a while now. I'm really happy with how it's turned out. We're going to go through some of the bits and pieces later on about some of the things that I thought worked well, things that didn't work so well, and, and how we can sort of overcome that. But anyway, let's get back to looking at the part. So first thing that hopefully you'll all notice is these arrows, 15 Newton meters. So I can't stress how important it is that if you're doing repeat production, mass production, um, or even similar types of jobs, use a torque wrench. You know, consistency is key. Without that, you'll never, you know, I don't want to inspect 100% of these. So I need to make sure my variation is as minimal as possible. I've been inspecting, um, I originally inspected every single one of these, because of course I've got four and four, so I've got eight up tens and I've got eight up twenties. So I've got eight finished parts coming off every time. First of all, I inspected every single one of these eight. Came off, I checked all the threads, I checked all the dimensions, and I was happy that every one was repeatable. I did that two or three times. What I did then was I checked just the two front ones every time. So every time I checked the dimensions off those two front ones, everything was fine. Now all I'm doing is doing a very quick sanity check. I check this one component here, and all I do is just check that the threat, sorry, it's not, it's this one up here. So this, this component up here actually. I check that one up there, I make sure that the threads are good and that it, it basically it just clips in. I've got um, I've got the part it mates to and I just quickly try it, make sure it clips in. What I'll do then is every 50 or so parts I'll then do a dimensional check. So sort of one in every eight, I'm doing a bit of a sanity check. Does it fit? Does it look right? Are the threads good? And then one in every 50 I'll actually do a dimensional check on there. So this is just in process inspection. Why? Am I doing that big blue one? Can anyone guess why I am only inspecting that one there in process? And then that will lead me on to a couple more questions. But yeah, but we've got the 15 newton meters there. So I'm talking each one of these down. I use 15 newton meters for both op 10 and op 20. Argument B, you probably could use less on op 20 than you do on op 10, but 15 newton meters is not much at all, so I'm not worried about that. I don't want to have to have two torque wrench or have to keep changing the torque settings, so one setting is more than fine for me. And then these arrows, this is where my datum stop is, so where I push the billet up to. So on this bank of op 10s, I push it to the right. On this bank of op 10s, I push it to the left. And then on these two, I push it to the right and to the right. I don't like the fact that I've got to go to the right on one and to the left on the other. But if I was to try and go to the um, to the right on this one, I'd be really close to this part here. I could probably make it work with a bit of faffing. That's one thing I would change again. So again, this will be what I've learned doing this. It's been about three years since I've done a production fixture, so I forgot some things and I got some things wrong. So I would probably want to go right 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 and right it doesn't feel nice when you're going right left right right but that's a small one spence anyone guessed why i checked that back one over there uh yeah got two guesses um first one from klaus uh it's the last one in the cycle mm -hmm. and el has said he's guessing that it's because it's the one that's furthest away from the center or i'm guessing the work offset location Right, so the um, the happy feeling is go to Klaus. So it More is exactly Klaus. that. It is because it is the last one in the cycle. So 
my drilling in op 10 goes one two three four five six seven eight so i drill and tap that one last and then in op 20 it's pretty much the same one two three four five six seven eight that's the last one what that then means for me is if i inspect that one i know that the tap hasn't broken the drill hasn't no none of the tools are broken if that one's right imagine if i was to inspect this part here those the tap could have snapped on this one and then those two would be wrong so brilliant klaus well done that leads me on to another point that i want to mention now again variation is our worst enemy we've got to keep consistency here so every single time i make a part this one this op 10 goes to that op 20 that op 10 goes to that op 20 that one goes to that one that so on and that means then that let's say there was something wrong with the machining of this one i mean it's a patterned part i'd probably need a problem with the ball screw on the machine but these things happen you know if that part went in any one of these finished op 20s how on earth would i track it down to that one but because i've got one and one two and two three and three four and four if I find a problem on four and it's on the op 10 side of number four, then I know it was made there. If, a, if I find a problem in the op 10 here, I know it's there. Does that make sense, everyone? I hope it does. Again, this is nothing to do with fusion. This is just generally chatting about um, good practices on machines. Got a question for you, Rich. <clears throat> Go for it. Uh, it's an interesting question. Maybe one okay. that we couldn't answer, but I'll, I'll leave it to you anyway. Can you recommend a torque wrench for the machine environment? Is there a go-to brand? What do you have at home? Um, okay, at home I have Halford stuff. Um, it's For me, it's the right sort of price range for what I want to pay for my hobby. Um, I wouldn't say it's the best. I wouldn't say it's the worst. Basically, look for what you can buy reasonably. Look for deals on. What I would say is when I buy anything, no matter what tool it is, if it's cordless power tools if it's um ratchet sets look at what other ranges they do i'm quite odd which you all probably know and i like to have matching things so i've got three different sizes all of the same brand torque wrench i like the fact they're all the same but most importantly spare parts i know that i can get the spare parts for those torque wrenches so have a look make sure that whatever you buy you can get spare parts for makes a big deal i recently my little quarter inch ratchet spanner um, i broke basically there's like, like some internal splines on the ratchet mechanism um, that was a kennedy again I, I just happened to get a kennedy ratchet set once um, and i could get the spare parts for it so again i've got no real recommendation other than look at what you can get in your budget and then if you can get one that has an available spare parts that's always a big winner for me for those in the us that don't have Halfords. I'm told that Walmart, Target, Sears, all good options. Yeah, again, again, similar type of stuff. For me, the brand doesn't matter. It's got to fit your budget, and it, it, it spare parts are available. I mean, I once had someone that said, "Doesn't matter what you can afford, but try and buy the best you can afford." Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you can af only afford a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or a hundred pounds or a thousand pounds. You know. Get what you can afford. Doesn't matter if someone else gets something better and bigger, but sort of get what you can. Get the best you can at that time. I'm a big fan of if you buy it cheap, you buy it twice. So again, just get what you can afford. Simple as that. And again, you don't need to buy everything all at once. You can get a lower range torque wrench this month, three or four months down the line, get a higher range one. Again, a lot of the tools I buy, I just get them as and when I need them, and they just go into my collection. Cool. I, I, need, I need to stop talking about tools. I could talk about them all, all day long, all day long. Anyway, let's get back to Fusion. So let's have a quick look at what we've done on this part here. So this is our component pattern. Let's have a look at the individual ops. So what we've got is we are, again, I'm not going to cover too much about the fixturing, everyone, because we've done it in the last two sessions now. If you have got any pressing questions, chuck them in the chat and I'll answer them, but I'm not going to go much over the fixturing as we've got here. So first thing I want to talk about actually is in this setup, what have I selected? I see a lot of problems with this uh, when I'm doing um, support on the forums. Right, the model body, this is the physical component you want to machine. So for me, it's this brown component in there. It's not the stock. The fixture then, for me, is, if I click on there, I hope it's going to show, it's the big fixture, 
it's that clamp, it's that bolt, it's that rest pad, it's that bolt, it's that clamp, it's that, it's, it's everything to do with that little set there, um, and even the base plate, so really good to make sure you do this right, I see a lot of problems where people have specified the wrong things, and it just causes problems, so make sure the body is the physical part you want to machine. Um, that's actually quite a good toolpath. What does it say? Considered for toolpath calculations. That's exactly what it's doing. The bit you want the toolpath to be applied to. Uh, and then the fixture is everything around it that you want it to be aware of, but not put toolpaths on. Stock as well. I modelled up the stock. Because I was doing the whole fixturing system, it just made a lot of sense for me to model up the stock. Uh, and then I chose that stock body from there. Right, so that was what I did in my setup. That's really important to get that right. Now, I've only selected one here, and then I've component patterned it across. So this has got its pluses and minuses. So if I had selected every single one, A, that's an absolute pain for me to do. But then also, when I just want to machine one, because um, we again, to run this off the first time, I just machined the first one. It's a bit difficult then because... The toolpaths try to look for all the different parts and, and it just it can have problems. So the way I tend to do this is I think of it as one entity here and then I do a, a pattern after there. Um, I could have selected every single one of them and applied the toolpaths to all of them, but I prefer patterns. So I've got my roughing pass here. Let's have a quick look along the part. And you can see there that I'm coming down as far as I can and then back up a little bit. We can even have a quick look at how I've defined that. And this is something that hopefully might be a, a useful thing for some of you. Your bottom height normally is to do with the model bottom. But I just wanted this to be as low as I could without hitting the fixture. So I went selection. I, I chose the fixture face and then I went back up half a mil. So I didn't actually choose anything to do with the part. I basically said I want to avoid this face by half a mil. So that's why I did that selection. Brilliant. So then we've got... Again, we've got that little 2D adaptive pass running around there. I then do a contour pass, and I'm doing that. So something to mention on this contour pass. Again, I'm just going to go through and talk about some of the key points, some of the things that I did different to the defaults. And the big one here, um, it, it did it actually automatically for me, so it's not in the selection. But what I want to show you is the entry position. It automatically chose that point, but that was more luck than judgment. But I want to make sure that the tool enters and exits at that corner. There are two reasons for this. Does anyone know what they are? Let me know. And again, this has got cutter compensation on. Actually, that's, um, I think I moved it slightly over the corner to get it different. But there are two reasons why I wanted to enter and exit there. What do we think they might be? So, once I've got that contour pass, there you go, that's, that's, that's how I've had it set before. Um, I do some drilling. So here we go, got some drilling in here, drilling down, some tips for my drilling ops. Again, everyone, I hope this sort of format's useful. I'm just going through explaining what I do. Um, now, the modelled part on here has the tap. Tap's hole needs to be all the way through the modelled bit. So if we just lift that up, and we see the whole bottom is there at that point. Now, if I untick this, you can see that my drill is going to drill down to that point there. What you can do is tick drill tip through bottom. And depending on your defaults, if that's set at zero, this is really quite cool, by the way, is that it actually drops the drill down far enough that the, the leading sort of tip, that, that tip angle, is put all the way down so you get a complete diameter hole at that point there. I can't say how cool that actually is, or else you'd have to calculate 118 degrees, what diameter, how far down do I have to go to make sure I get a complete cut at the whole bottom. Now, that's to make sure the hole's cut, but actually that's what my tap needs to be doing. My tap needs to be doing that to make a full depth. So I've now gone down seven millimeters. Why have I gone seven? Um, well, because I could. So simply, I've gone down seven because seven puts it out the bottom of the billet. Um, and I've already snapped two taps doing this. That was mainly because of my issues with feeds and speeds and I got a bit of swarf trapped. But the, it's so quick to drill these. The, the, the more I drill down, the safer it is effectively. 
Spence, anyone guess why I put that entry position back at the corner? Yeah, a couple of guesses. I think Klaus is going to be two from two here, but um, Klaus and Shaz, Shaz both said to avoid marks in the middle of the face and to hide the marks from the lead-in and lead-out move. Yeah, bang, bang on, everyone. Bang on. So, basically, every time the tool engages and disengages, you will leave a witness mark of some, some proportion. Depending on your machine, your tools, your fixturing, it could be microscopic or it could be feel it with your finger but what you can try and do as a trick and again yeah this is this is brilliant on wood and wooden routers is hide that lead in and lead outs on corners or on sort of transitional parts where you can lead in and lead out and you won't notice actually if there's a lip or a little step there so again that was why i went on that corner um what you might notice here this big arc is it's got cut of compensation on Again, if you've got cutter compensation on your machine and you're not using it, why not? Watch my video on how to update toolware with probing. Um, cutter compensation is brilliant. It means that you can make sure that you get accurate parts repeatedly. And if you need to tweak a dimension, don't do it with stock to leave on fusion. You've all been warned I'll seek you out and shout at you. Don't adjust your stock to leave on fusion if it's machining wrong on the machine. You've got to think, if I want to machine a 10 mil square, and I've modelled up a 10 mil square, and I machine it and it comes out at 10.2, don't put negative 0.1 stock to leave on. It's, it's just wrong. Use cutter compensation, go into your uh, tool table and do it properly and do it there. You've been warned, I will hunt you down and I'll wave my finger at you. Consider them warned. <laughs> Consider them warned. I think I got Quick question about your there. fixture. Go for it, yeah. Um, is it, well, an easy one to start. Is it made out of aluminium? Yes. And therefore, is there a risk of the threads pulling out on the hold, hold down grips? Yes, there is a 100% um, a chance. Stuart uses Mitobytes and aluminium fixtures and he's nervous of the threads. Okay, so what I could do is I could have helicoiled them or I could have put a thread insert in. Um, because this is only just going to be for these live streams, I wasn't going to spend the time. But think about this. That's an M6 thread. If I was to helicoil it, I need to drill it out bigger. If I was to um, a th put a threaded insert in, I'd have to drill it out bigger. I could always go bigger than M6. So I've drilled all those holes at M6 now. If I wanted to put an M6 threaded insert in, they, I don't know what they, let's say they're an M10 outer diameter. Well, I'll just drill it and do it. It's fine. You know, I'll, I'll run this until it wears out. And then I can look at doing threaded inserts. And I can do everything on there. And bear in mind, yes, it's made out of aluminium. But all the pressure points are replaceable. These grippers, those rest pads, that gripper. Of course, these aren't replaceable because these actually require the form to hold the part. But there's not a lot of wear on that because it's a full nice machine form pressing up flat face against flat face it's not a great deal of wear is going to happen on there but on this one because it's a a rough extrusion the chances are it will start to wear and mark and and lift an edge over um so yeah that's what that is hope for that answers the questions yeah definitely so yeah uh, you can always make a hole bigger you can't make it smaller yeah steel inserts a couple of people recommended those as well off the back of that question so i think yeah you're on. You're on the same same wavelength there. Yeah. Uh, before you carry on, Rich, I'm going to. Uh, I'm just going to say, I normally do this at the end of the video, but of course, not everybody stays to the end. So, if you're liking the live streams, give us a big thumbs up. YouTube loves a thumbs up. Uh, give us a like. YouTube obviously likes it. Um, if you haven't already, you can subscribe to the channel. And once you press subscribe, if you hit that little bell icon. You'll get notified every time we uh, we release a video, including these live streams, so you'll never miss one again. And slightly differently to normal, um, there's a new Autodesk podcast out there uh, called The New Possible. And you can find links to that in the description below. You can find it on Spotify, Apple, Google, and there's also a blog about it too. So if you're interested in listening to the podcast, check out the links in the description. Cool. Cheers, Spence. Thank you very much. Um, I've just realised 
I'm running well out of time, so let's carry on. Um, right, okay, now I have, um, I've drilled first here. Um, I've drilled that one, it's a different size. I've then spot faced these and spot faced that one. Um, and then I've tapped. So, okay, so we can see that I went drill tip through bottom and seven millimeters on the drill. And I've gone drill tip through bottom and three and a half millimeters on my tap. So what this basically means is, to the bottom of the tap, it's going to go down three and a half millimetres. Um, how did I work this out, I hear you say? Basically, what I did was I got a, a my tap and I got a nut. And I, again, this is really, really quite a um, complex way of measuring. I just quickly screwed the nut on the tap until I felt that I had at least one good thread. And then I just used my vernier caliper to measure down and just quickly check the distance on there. Really nice and simple. I haven't got that bolt or that, that nut that I used, um, but you can sort of imagine, let me grab, I've actually got an M4 tap right here. Here we go. Let me grab one with a massive lead in. Again, these are machined, uh, these are hand taps. So again, if if I show you the, the correct end there, you probably can't see that too clear. Let me flip to the bigger camera um, and then we'll see what you can see on there. So here, if we get to focus, come on, focus. Anyway, the lead-in is from about there to approximately there. Now, I mean, I could have, I could have got my calipers and gone down and gone. I reckon it's about there. It's not that easy though, so I just quickly screwed a nut on, held that, and then measured it with a nut. Again, you could look. But anyway, um, again, this is a, a first tap. So, can anyone tell me the three types of taps that you have in a tap set? Um, I want the proper names. Um, so that was the first tap. Well, there's your, there's your uh, example of, the, of number one in the set. Um, and that, was, of course, got a massive lead in. That's got a 7 mil lead in. But the machine tap, the spiral flute tap that I've got in the machine, has about a 3 mil lead. So I went half a mil just to get a bit extra on there. Brilliant. Um, okay, another question for you. I'm, I'm rattling these questions out today, Spence. Uh, this was from a video that I saw. Um, this is my vernier caliper. What are the, we've got one, two, three, we've got four possible ways of using this. How, how, how what are those four ways you can use a vernier caliper? People don't know the fourth one. I'm surprised. But anyway, has anyone answered my tapping question, Spence? Uh, no. <sighs> no. Okay, I'll leave it a minute and I'll put everyone out the misery. Um, right. There's no, um, there's no chamfer modelled on that part there, um, but I was fed up, I cut my hand on it, um, so I went back and I put a tiny, tiny little break edge chamfer on there of 0 0.07, so 70 micron chamfer. Um, yeah, I just got fed up of sharp bits poking in my hands, so I put a little chamfer on there. So again, real nice, if you haven't modelled a chamfer on, you can pop the chamfer on. Uh, there I have modelled the chamfer, so again, Top tip, hope you'll remember this from, I think, the first ever live stream I did. If you've modelled the chamfer, the chamfer width is zero. If you haven't modelled the chamfer, then you put the, the, the amount you want to go in there. If I go back to Fusion, actually, that's going to work, because I forgot I'm not showing you Fusion. Sorry, everyone. So let's go back. There wasn't a chamfer along that edge there, um, so I put one in. And I put the little 0.07 in, and then there was a chamfer modelled on there, so that came back to being zero. So if it's modelled, that's zero. If it's not modelled, you type it in. When I very first started using Fusion, I could never work out why my half a mil chamfers were always a millimetre. That's because I modelled them at half a millimetre and then put half a millimetre in. So it doubled it up and made it a millimetre. Anyone got the tap question, Spence? I don't think so, Rich. You have to put people okay. out of misery, I think. It's called a first, a second, and a plug tap. So you oh, first. Somebody one... got that. So, sorry. Stuart got it. He said first, taper, and plug. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, first, taper, and plug's fine. I, I learned was first, second, and plug, but the, the key one is like the, the, the order that they're in. The first one is a 
massive lead in, help you get started, help you get straight. The next one is a little bit less of a lead in. And then the plug, dependent on what it's got, could have almost no lead in. And also it's got no point on it. It's normally flat as well. Again, those can vary, but that sort of ethos. Great. You got some decent answers for your uh, for any of Well, I'll I'll get the machine running in a second, and I'll and I'll, and I'll go back to that. Okay. So Perfect. one thing I've got here is a pattern, and this is different. This is a component pattern, not a linear pattern. So a linear pattern patterns them across and up, whereas a component pattern. This is amazing. Let me um let me do this again. Let me go for this again. So what a component pattern does is you select the source. And it just looks for every instance of that component it can find and it patterns it. How brilliant is that? So I don't have to go, oh, was it? I mean, for example, the spacing on here is 33.33333. I know that was a design oversight on my part. That was a stupid thing to do, but I should have done it as 34 or 33, not 33.33333. Anyway, whereas a component pattern, you don't have to remember your linear patterns. And also, if you haven't got them in a if they're not in a sort of strategically uh, strategically spaced positioning, and if they're in different orientations on like a tombstone or something, you can use component pattern, and you can choose the source, and it just puts them all over where it can find the instances. How brilliant is that? If you wanted to unselect some, you untick automatic, and then you tick the target. So I'm not going to save time, but I could actually have all, I could have all these four on here, I could untick automatic and I could go target is you, you and you, and then it would pattern it onto those four. So really good thing, component patterns. Um, again, all patterns have got their place, but component is really good if you model everything up correctly. Let's jump over onto this machine while um, I do that. So Spence, what were the answers for the um, Vernier question? So, lots of people guessing. Okay, uh, let's go there's, back to this one, actually. Yeah, go on. There's an, there's an outer. An outer, so yeah. So, let me grab something to measure, actually. Yeah. Let's measure Let's measure this spanner. Okay, outer, yeah, we've got that one. We've got an outer diameter. you got an inner. Yeah, we've got the inner. You've then, got a depth. We've got a depth. There we go. Which is this little pokey bit here. And another depth with the back. Oh, that's the one everyone forgets. It's actually called a step, and it's from there to there. I've, I've seen people trying to measure. Oh, I need something with a big step on it. Let's grab this part. Um, nothing like a bit of preparation, is the Spence? Yeah, I love it. That's what these live streams are all about. Yeah, and that, that's not going to work. <laughs> grab another part. Right, this part here. So, big part here. Let's say I wanted to measure... Um, I, this is too heavy for me to do with the camera. But let's say I wanted to measure from this face to to that there. Let me see if I can do this. What it might have to do is might have to get that camera pointed a bit down. If I was to try and use this here now, I mean, look at how difficult this is for me. I've got to try and get that there. And if I was to be off slightly, off the centre, you can imagine it's going to give me a different measurement on there. If I use these two bits here, look at how much more surface area I've got there. I can be left to right, and the thing still comes down nice and flat, and I get a good measurement. So again, everyone forgets that you can use those two back ones. The amount of surface area is brilliant on there. So much easier than trying to use that little pronged measurement. Um, again, that's definitely got its place, because again, it's so small it can go down inside holes. Um, you know, I couldn't measure that depth with the other method, um, but I can measure it with that one. So again, well done whoever got that. I watched a YouTube video the other day and they were measuring like that, and I was like, no, use the steps, please. Somebody said there's a fifth, Rich. Oh, go for it. It's it's a ruler. It's a ruler. Because well, it's got the measurements printed... on it. Oh no, go, log off, go away. It is not a ruler. Like if... I'm with him. I think it's a ruler. No. I'm sorry. Not not a chance. Well done, Robin. I think it's a good suggestion. <laughs> um, I would say that I wouldn't trust how accurate those are printed on there. Right. Um, 
I've just re I finished the whole cycle. You can see I've got finished up 20s. I've got finished up 10s. So let's take these out. And again, I do try and take these out in a bit of an order. Let me go and just pop them on my side here. So at least then if I look back and I quickly see when I'm just checking on these, I do like to know what's gone on. So take these out in a little bit of an order. And there we go on there. Right, let's now take these out. Right, these actually are a little bit stuck, and I'll explain why. Um, well, first of all, because I haven't done them. Uh, that's why they'd be stuck. But I, I, there are a couple that keep getting a bit stuck on here. And I'll show you why and show you what I need to change on this fixture if I was to make it again. Um, little things again, I've learned that I need two rotations of the screw to lift the clamp up enough on this side. Um, so you see, you'll just probably get used to how things are on there. But again, really, really happy with this fixture. I was worried about Swarf. Um, getting stuck down in all these holes. I haven't had a big problem with that yet, so it looks okay. Right then, so we've got the first one. Let's go in there. I have given this all a really big clean off before the, the live stream, so if you're saying I haven't cleaned it off enough, I did it all beforehand. Because we are almost professional. How's the chat going, Spence? I haven't insulted anyone, have I, too much today? No, no. Uh, Robin took it took it very well. He just started laughing at you. So that's uh, fine. What else have we got in here? There's some there's some interesting question. One that we could maybe answer towards the end. Um, is there a difference, and what difference does it make if you choose the top or the bottom of the chamfer? Um, you have to choose the top because that's where the, that's where it's being driven from. Is the top of the chamfer. If you choose the bottom, it doesn't do it correctly. I, I can probably show you in fusion if we've got time later. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's definitely the top of the chamfer you need to choose. Hope right. Answer the question. Yeah, it basically puts it down far too deep if you choose the bottom. So there are all my up twenties. Remember, I need to make sure they're down. Think about datums, everyone. Again, my datum is flat down, up to that stop and up to this stop. It's X, Y, Z datums. So flat down. I tend to just you you can't see, but I tend to just do a little rock left and right with my two fingers um, on there. That's going to make sure if there's a piece of swarf underneath, I'd feel it rock. So I just quickly do that. I push it up to there that way. As, as my arrow shows me, remember my little arrows I did? I was quite pleased with those. And then my clamp is going to push it that way naturally. So again, quickly put on there, a couple of turns, and click. Click. I mean, again... Let's whiz through these nice and quickly. I'd rather get this done. There we go. Again, really nice having a torque wrench. If you are doing repeated parts and you can get a torque wrench, please do it. Or just just mean that you also know that things have tightened down properly. If you don't use a torque wrench, you could be thinking, oh, I wonder if that's actually gone down far enough. Has it clamped it enough? You never quite know. Got a bit of swarf on there. Again, I was worried about Swarf going in there underneath those gaps that you can see under the Mighty Bites. But from what I can see so far, um, I'm not getting much Swarf under there. It's working as I'd hoped. Again, these slot down onto those rest pads and flat up against that side. So you can see here, I'm pushing that bank that way and that bank that way. There we go. Right, I'm going to quickly tighten these up with... My Allen key quickly, and then I'll torque wrench them all up as well. You will actually see if I um, if I show you later the 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 grippers do actually slightly mark the aluminium, and that was how I worked out the torque. If anyone was wondering how I worked out the torque, um, I put a part in and I kept slowly increasing the torque until it just the teeth started to mark the part. Ideally, you want as little torque as you can get away with. Um, a, it puts, puts less stress and strain on everything, um, but also, um, now, those of you that watched my live streams before, um, now I love to tell a little story. So, a um, company I used to work for, we used to make um, steel forgings and machine them, and we did some parts for a, uh, a car um, customer that wants, an OEM, and the it was a big bore we were machining, and... We actually clamped the forging with hydraulic clamps. We just turned the thing up as high as it would go, because why wouldn't you? We machined this bore, um, really tight tolerance. We checked it in the machine. It was absolutely bang on. 
We then tried to insert a ball joint into it, and it was just completely wrong. Couldn't work out what was going wrong, and it was oval. We were clamping the part that hard that when we actually were distorting the part, when we took the clamp off, it was oval. So when we clamped it and measured it in its clamped position, it was fine. Then when we released the clamps, it was oval. I mean, I'm not going to do that here and now um, with these little things. It's just, it's, you're not going to get enough force on them. But effectively, you want as little force as you can get away with. It just helps everything last longer. Right, op 10, here we go. You might have noticed the eagle eye viewed amongst you is in fusion, that facing operation wasn't in the pattern. That was actually because, imagine if I want to do that big face mill cut, I don't want it doing like a little bit on each part, a little bit on each part. So that was outside of the um, pattern, that facing up was. Let me get that camera up a little bit for you. Um, and effectively, I just drew a rectangle in the design environment, just drew a sketch all the way around all the op tens, and then I just use that as a stock contour in my face. I'll show you this infusion in a second, and that's facing all eight parts at once. So that's what we did there. Let's have a quick look in fusion um, while that's machining away. So there you go, you can see that rather than seeing me now. So that was what I had there. The facing up was here, um, and it's outside of the pattern. So if we have a quick look, you can't, my sketch is invisible, but you can see I drew a sketch where that yellow line was, and that was my stock contour, rather than my stock contour being the stock as it would be. How are we going in the chat, Spence? Everyone happy? Yeah, very good. We got Mar Marco on the call. Good to have you on a live stream, Marco. Uh, giving some good advice about the difference between 2D chamfer and 2D contour when you're chamfering apart. Mr. Tax? Correct. Well done. Um, there's a little bit of chat about setup sheets, which might be a good topic for another live stream. Definitely, yeah. Um, how to make them how to use them efficiently those types of things um and there was a question well there's a couple of comments would through air help with the part sticking in the in the fixture that you had sure. oh no okay so yeah the reason the parts are sticking in the fixture is um the material that i modeled up and that i thought i was using was 12.5 the material i got was 12.7 so um, it was just far too tight and you know it, it's just gripping in there too much so all it needs a little bit of a screwdriver and it flicks up and out but it's you know you want these so you don't have to use anything other than the tool to open it with you shouldn't need to use screwdrivers as pry bars to remove stuff um so yeah that was again i'm changing it if you in infusion what I could do is machine a bit out of those three faces and space those back by 0.2. Um, again, because the, the Mighty Bike clamps like on a slot, so that won't matter that the hole was in 0.2 in the wrong place. Um, again, you can always take material off, you can't add it back on. So if I was to do this for a job, I'd probably, if I knew I was repeatedly getting 12.7, not 12.5, I'd take some material out of those three faces and just give it a bit more room so I can lift the billet out um, again. One final question for you, Rich. Uh, something that they noticed last time. Why did you probe your fixture instead of using the Lang Zero Point? Oh, um, because the basically there's... Um, a bike manufacturer called Pembury, who I've actually asked if I could use his part for this. This isn't my part, this is someone else's part. Um, and I've basically said after I've done the design, well, if he wants to use the design, he can use the design. He hasn't got a Lang Zero Point system, so he'll have to probe that hole. So purely is, and again, um, I'm hoping that when we can all see you again at Fusion Academy, at so on and so forth, I might bring this as a little demo. I think it's quite a nice little demo. Um, I, of course, I might not have the Lang Zero Point system with me. So that just gives me an extra datum on the part, on the on the fixture that I can probe if I need to. Or if I haven't got a probe, I can use a dial test indicator and I can clock up off there. Perfect. Um, and I was just about to type the answer to this, but we might as well do it live. Uh, patterns automatically reduce tool changes, correct? 
well, when you say automatically, it is an option. Yeah, that's what I meant. Are you going or am I going, Spence? <laughs> I was just about to say, do you want to elaborate? Basically, in the, uh, in, the, in the pattern dialogue, you've got a couple of different options. You can order by tool. So it's going to do all of one tool, all the next tool, and so on and so forth. You can order by part. So it's going to do all of one part, all of the next part, all of the next part. And what's the third option in there, Rich? Um, quite well, it. I've got preserve order, order by operation, order by tool. That's for a linear pattern. Let me go right. for the, um, the component pattern. And then you've got, you haven't got order by part. You've got preserve order, which I suppose yeah. is order by part. Order by operation, order by tool. Uh, so operation would go. mean it would do all the adaptives, then all the contours, then all the drillings. It doesn't think actually I can use that tool for two of them. So yeah. But something to bear in mind as well is um, I'm of course I output both of these together. So I output op 10 and op 20, and then in the NC programs you can reorder to minimise tool change from there. I believe preserve order is part by part, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, I believe that as well. We can have a look at that. So again, uh, I'm conscious of time. This has been 45 minutes. I try and keep them to half an hour, but that never happens. Um, just while I wrap up on the finishing things, get those questions in for me. Um, I want to get as many things as you can. Um, I assume you all want to watch the machine run rather than me. So that's why the machine's there, not me. Um, but yeah, so please let us know any questions you've got. Max didn't realise there was patterns in Fusion. I think it's just changed his life. Oh, yeah. Honestly, um, I, I've used linear patterns loads. I never really use component pattern. Um, you, know, you use what you know, and I just I never play with them. And I've started using them now, and pff, mind blown. If we could do emojis, we would. The beauty about the component pattern is it will observe and... Uh... Well, it basically observes any rotations, right? So if you've got something like a tombstone where your component is in different orientations, it doesn't matter. It'll follow the component and its orientation around the, the yeah. fixture. Um, yeah, which is, like you said, it's a bit of a game changer, really. Yeah, it really is. I mean, I remember when I, when I first used Fusion, I was doing this one with Denver, Denver Nova Mill. I made six and I like modeled and put the tool paths on all six of them. Um, and I look back now and just go, what was I doing? What was I doing? But yeah. Cool. So again, machines go around. Now, hopefully, this will do the drilling next. Yes, it is. This drilling is quite impressive. Again, solid tungsten carbide drills. Real nice heavy feed rate on there. Um, bit like a knife through butter. I wish my machine at home drilled as nice as that. What cycle are you using for your drilling ops, Rich? Um, I'm just using standard. Let's have a quick look at that. What's it actually called? Rapid out. Again, no pecking. It's 3.3 mil diameter. It's not very deep, um, and it's aluminium. Again, um, the, the the big thing about drilling is swarf evacuation. Um, there's two ways of doing swarf evacuation. The one is to get your chip breaking correct, and that's speeds and feeds. Get those speeds and feeds working correctly. Get the chips breaking. The rest is either coolant or air. We haven't got through air or through tall coolant on our um, VF2 here. So if we do do really deep holes and we can't get the coolant down there, that's when we start doing the pecks. The pecking is purely there to help the swarf get out of the hole. It's better for the tool to do to not do pecking. Because you want to think every time you engage, it's actually blunting the surface slightly because it's got to get under the skin of the material. It's far more efficient to do a, a rapid, well, rapid out, which is a feed in and a rapid out. You only peck when you really need to, and that's when you can't get rid of the swarf. So, yeah. Max is asking if there's uh, no through spindle coolant on the Haas. No, through, through tall and through spindle, the same same thing in my book. So, yeah. Um, you can buy it as an option. It's just not on our machine. Um, don't know why. It just wasn't spec'd up. So, maybe they got me the trunnion instead of the through spindle coolant, but... Yeah. Would you use it if it was there? Oh yeah, 100%. You, you would not use it. So, yeah, you'd uh, basically use it on anything that. Um, well, you could use it on absolutely any tool, really. But you've also got to make sure again. 
don't want to go into this too much because we're nearly at the hour. Um, but it's basically, depending on what tool holders you're using, it's not very good using them with ER collets because of all the gaps in them. Effectively, it just goes all the way around the tool. Um, you should probably use hydro locks or something similar when you're using through tool coolant, just to make sure all the coolant actually goes through the tool rather than not. And again, if you've maybe got um, end mills or chamfer mills or spot drills that haven't got through tool coolant, it um, probably wouldn't do any much damage, but it's not going to do your machine, you know, it's not going to be happy if you're trying to pump high pressure through spindle coolant through and it can't go anywhere. You've got to make sure that you've got the right tooling and the tool holders to then go with it. Yeah, so thank you everyone. Again, I've tried to cover loads today about how I program this, what's going on differently, what would I do again differently. Um, but yeah, so fingers crossed you've enjoyed the session. I've enjoyed doing this sort of three part series. If you've got any more ideas of any more sort of series we can do where we go right from the bare bones of something up to making it. Um, then I'd love to hear your suggestions. Again, it's quite rare that we get to do something like we would in industry. I mean, look now, I've got I've got eight finished components just off that one cycle. So again, it's been really nice for me to actually do a, a proper task rather than just doing make a square block with a hole in it. So please let us know some ideas you've got. Um, I'd love to put them into practice. And yeah, we'll try and cover as many of our sort of machining top tips and fusion top tips as we can throughout the course of the live streams. How about this, Rich? How about we set up a thread on the forums and get people to post ideas for what they want to see in the live streams and then the ones that get the most likes, we can Ooh, tackle those first. yes, because you can like threads. In the I like that. That's good. I'm happy with that. Perfect. So we'll, we'll set that up. We'll put it the link in the description of this video once it's also up, or as a comment, or we'll communicate somehow, and uh, get on there. Let us hear your suggestions for videos, and we'll uh, we'll start doing that very very soon. Perfect. Cheers, everyone! Again, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Hope you found this useful, um, and we'll see you all again next time. Stay safe and happy machining. Thanks, everybody. Bye.